Well, hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. I wanted to let you know that this summer, I will be teaching a two-week workshop with JSS in Chivita from June 24th to July 8th, 2019. So join me in Civita Castellana, where we will paint the Italian countryside and idyllic village just north of Rome. This is a two-week landscape painting workshop in Italy, where we will focus on fundamental painting skills and personal critiques. The best way to improve your painting skills is to get out there and paint more. So you will get plenty of painting time along with direct feedback in our critiques. I won't sugarcoat that feedback, but at the same time, I know what it's like to try your best and still not quite get what you were looking for. So you'll learn how to deal with that if or when it happens. After two weeks of painting with me, you'll leave with a better understanding of color, how color reacts to its surrounding hues, and how to mix the right one for your canvas. You'll learn the right questions to ask yourself so that you can accurately depict the colors of the Italian landscape, including those infinite greens. As you wander through the cobblestone streets of Civita and look out over the countryside, you'll notice a distinctive quality to the light. We'll talk about how to capture that light and depict the effects of atmospheric perspective onto your canvas. How you arrange an image, the shapes that you choose to emphasize, what you decide to include or remove, these are the decisions that strengthen or weaken a painting. These choices are also what make your work uniquely yours. So when artists ask, how do I find my voice? It starts here, and we're gonna talk a lot about that in our time together. JSS in Chivita is a program like none other. You get to experience the birthplace of landscape painting, meet lots of artists who share your passion for painting, have access to weekly excursions to see important works of art, and weekly JSS-sponsored communal dinners. It is so much fun. So if you want to find out about this unique experience, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshops. And I hope to paint with you in Italy. My guest this week on the Savvy Painter podcast is the artist Linda Christensen. Linda paints a moment in time of women's lives. She looks for the emotional connection and tries to capture it. Linda talks about an early experience seeing a piece by the Bay Area figurative painter David Park, which resonated deeply with her and taught her that it is possible to capture emotion and transfer that to the viewer. In this episode, we explore why she looks to, quote, get it wrong in her painting. She likes to sneak up on the emotions of the painting and work from a place of not knowing. Linda also shares tips she uses herself to stay in the studio when she doesn't feel like it. And we also talk about how she uses distraction to her advantage when she's in the studio. Linda shares tips on choosing a gallery and pricing work, something I know a lot of artists struggle with, and also not just when, but how you should raise your prices. So let's jump in. Without further ado, here is Linda Christensen. Linda, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm delighted to speak with you today. My pleasure. Thank you. What was it that made you decide to devote yourself to the arts? Do you remember that when you made that decision? I never really clearly made that decision. I knew that I was a watcher and uh, I was going to watch other people have a life. And I was enjoying just being an observer. And it wasn't until I was back at UCSC to finish my degree that I did a series of monoprints titled When She Gets the Time. And I felt that way about myself. When I get the time, I want to be a painter. That was sort of a pivotal point. What was it about that that struck you and made it a pivotal point? Well, I had a longing. I had a longing I had not understood or felt before. I had been uh, painting still life and landscapes and abstracts. And I was pretty good at them, but I didn't understand what the connection was to me. I just, it didn't seem like a big deal. It didn't seem important. It didn't grab me. 
And when I was introduced to David Park's work, I saw something that reminded me of my childhood, of an emotional connection. And I realized that I can paint that. That's real for me. That's something that I recognize. And I recognize in the Bay Area figurative painters something of myself and their work. And that got me started. I would love to hear that story if you remember which David Park you were looking at or what the, you know, was it in a book? Was it in a, at the museum? It was in class, I believe. Maybe it was like a uh, art history class. I don't remember, but I think it was an image I'd seen and it was the bathers. I think it was two or three figures at a lake and a woman had her arms up with a towel Yeah, so I saw an image of my mother at the clothesline when I was a child, and I had an emotional connection to that work. And I didn't realize that emotions could be painted. It was uh, new to me. And being a very sensitive, emotional person, I got it. And uh, I just made it my own. What is it that you try to capture in your paintings? I'm still trying to figure that out, and I think that's what keeps me going. It's one of the things that gets me in the studio, is trying to still get that elevator speech of 30 seconds of what the work's about, because uh, I'm still searching for answers, which is more of a self-exploratory assignment that I have for myself. It's just exploring who I am and what it is about myself that reacts so strongly to these female figures that have a moment in time for themselves and seem to be contemplating something or listening to something or recreating or experiencing, re-experiencing something. I can't really say, but there's nostalgia, there's sadness, there's wondering, there's all kinds of emotions. So you were talking about trying to get that intensity of the emotions in of the women in in your painting, um, and I'm curious when you're because your your work is that sort of Bay Area figurative ish, let's say painting style, just to kind of give people an idea of what kind of work you do. Actually, would you mind describing that for everyone? What your how you would describe your work? Well, visually, it usually involves one, two, or three women. And I've been asked, why women? And it's because I am a woman. A lot of it is it's self-portrait, really. There's usually a lot of pattern, a lot of paint, a lot of looseness, nothing really too spelled out, never a face. I always want you to watch the body language. That's what I am interested in. I want you to pay attention to that. They're large. I'm five foot two, so basically my life size. <laughs> and uh, they're six by five, a lot of them, and pretty colorful palette, I would say. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good representation of it. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you. You said that they're mostly paintings of you, but I'm curious, you know, since you're trying to capture these emotions and you mentioned earlier that you're you sort of described yourself as a a sensitive person, an observer, somebody who watches and I imagine notices a lot of things about people. Could you describe how you choose what you're going to paint, like what that process is for you? Are you, as you go about your, your day or your week, watching people and then coming home and painting that? Or how do you bring that into your studio? Well, the thing that keeps it interesting is I have no clue how I do it, and I have no clue how I start. I think I know, and then it's different every time. I start with, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost. I'm afraid. I'm searching. Oftentimes, I'll use photos of my daughter. She'll sometimes pose in a way that I'm happy with. But it's not the same. I, I mean, I start with her. I might start with her. I use a, usually do a tracing. So it's just it's not her anymore. It's just shapes. I've done, you know, just make stuff up as I go, create an image from memory. 
I never sketch. I never want the detail. I want the feeling. And if I get too involved, like working with a life model, that's too involved for me. It would take away from the spontaneity. It would make me want to get it right. And my work is not about getting it right. It's really about getting it wrong because I'm trying to be imperfect because I am imperfect and we all are. And I'm trying to create a sense of comfort and a heaviness in the body that makes this person feel grounded and present. Sometimes I'll start with an abstract and just get a lot of pattern and color and just just sort of ease my way into it, sort of sneak up on it. Because there is a lot of pressure to like paint emotion. How do you do that? It's impossible to put into words. It's just it comes and allowing and taking time and, and just sometimes just putting paint on the canvas can take me there. And so it's not something I can conjure up. It just has to happen. Would you describe then sort of a typical day in your studio? What is that like? You mentioned earlier that you were you were meditating uh, this morning. So I'm just kind of curious how you start your day, what your r- routine is, if any. Well, I'm really working on self-care. So meditation is part of that. But I always work out. Uh, run errands, call my mother, any other phone calls I have to make so that when I go into the studio, I don't have to remember anything because I won't. If I have a two o'clock, three o'clock appointment, I won't remember that and I'll just sail right through it. (laughs) I don't like to be bookended. That's what I call it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I make sure that I have an old black and white movie on to watch. It's whatever soothes me. And that can soothe me. And number one, I'm watching a basically gray scale. So I'm working in color, but I'm looking at a gray scale on the TV. And it's a movie, you know, I've seen a million times. The plot is simple. I don't have to really follow it, but it's, it keeps me in the room. So my, my recipe is whatever keeps me in the room because it's. Oh, that's interesting. So full of fear and not knowing and the editor coming in too early saying you're getting it wrong. All those things are going on. And my advice to students is always like, whatever you can do, is it warm enough? Is your tummy full? Do you have music on that you like? Or something that like listening to a novel where you only can listen to it there and you want to stay in the room to listen to it. So whatever can keep you there. So you know, usually around noon, I get in there and work till five off and on. I, my studio is right here in my in my house. So I touch back in all the time when I've got a project going and check it and recheck it and visit. It's kind of concentrated, but broken up throughout the day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. What are the movies that you that you like to watch? Oh, my gosh. Anything with Catherine Hepburn. I do it. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's completely that's exactly what I envision. Yes, I'm like, oh, yes. she's in there watching Catherine Hepper and I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it has to be in black and white. It can't be a color movie. Number one, the plot is probably way more complicated than a black and white movie. And uh, I can't look up. I just have to I kind of have to know it. It's just background. Yeah, yeah. But I'm working. I'm looking at the canvas. Then I look at the television and I walk back and turn around and look at the work I'm working on to see what pops, what's wrong, what's not working. So I follow this pattern, like I wear a path in the carpet. That's my routine. <laughs> I love it. Because, yeah, if you're sitting there, you, like, it's a cleansing of the palate, I would guess, for your for your eyes. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. I've experienced that where I, that sneaking up part of it where you're, turn away to do something else, allow that cleansing of the palate to happen. And then you turn around and you can just barely see what needs to be done. And it's like vaporous. If you don't catch it fast enough, it disappears. Yes. And even after you've had the work photographed, then you see something. It's like, oh my gosh, that's so glaring. Why didn't I notice that? And it's, you don't have that objectivity. You know, it's hard to get that when you're in the moment. So walking away and turning and coming back. Yeah, you can catch things. Mm -hmm. 
When you're working from that that place of not knowing that you described, do you ever feel frustrated by that not knowing? Oh, (laughs) all the time. And again, that's whatever can soothe me at that time. Usually I do something radical, like I'll paint with my left hand, or I have a couple of paintbrushes that are taped to a long stick, and I'll grab that, or anything to just stir it up even more. If I'm frustrated, I'll just lean into that. And I might put a stencil on over something that was something I really liked. And just uh, say to myself, you know, I'm just gonna let this go. (sighs) You know, turn it upside down or whatever it takes to just sort of um, mess with my head, because that's what's in the way is my head. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask if when you're doing that, when you're taking the long stick or painting over that part that you had just fallen in love with or killing your darlings, as they say, what's going on with your editor? It gets overridden for sure. And then it gets playful and fun again. But it's uh, making the decision to do that that's hard because you think it'll never get good again. But it has to breathe. It has to get good. And it has to sort of go through a crisis again, and then get reborn. It's sort of like a break in an arm. They say where it's healed is the strongest part of your arm. And I I think that about a painting. It becomes a from a short story to a novel only through that tearing it down and building it back up. It's hard to remember, but I, and I do want to be finished. This looks finished. This feels finished. But sometimes I'm forced to keep working on it. And it gets better and better. And collectors really do know the difference. There's no shortcut. There's no formula. It's the angst. It's the wear and tear, you know, on the artist, putting the time and putting the effort in. It really shows in the work. Mm. So you were were talking about um, when you're working on these paintings and kind of that struggle of when it's kind of telling you that you need to continue on to it. But how lots of people have different answers for this. But how would you um, how do you decide when your painting is done? My answer is it's never done. It's just a different painting. And you're still working on the painting, no matter what could be. I just finished it and it's out in the gallery and I still want to bring it back and work on it. It's never done. It might be done for the day. It might be done for the month, but I grow as a person. I change. I'm more observant or less, or I'm going through something. And so if I were working on the painting, it would change. I have a friend that is constantly wanting to be current with his work. He wants to keep reworking it to make it today's work. And (laughs) That was then, and this is now, but it's really, I'm still working out the same problems with every single painting. It's all one painting. Mm, That's brilliant in a way to just take each, to allow the conversation to continue. You just take it to a new canvas effectively. Yeah. Is it difficult for you to let the painting go? For example, when you, when you have to take it out to a gallery and you're, you're not done with that conversation? I feel done in the moment at that time, you know, it's on the truck, it's ready to go. I'm thrilled. And then when I go to the opening, I think, oh, gosh, I wish I had my paintbrush and my canvas with I mean, my palette with me. I really want to work on that. It needs more. I want to say more. But that's my story. Other people are thrilled with the work. And that's great. But I, I still have more to say. And that certainly keeps me working. I still get a lot of a lot out of the subject matter. Like I say, I can't really completely define it. I don't really know why I'm doing it, but it brings me a lot of joy. And then um, temporarily, and then I want to say it again, only I want to say it differently, or I want to say it this way or that way, or I think I could explain it better only through paint, though. And it's the carrot that I just can't quite grasp. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I'd love to go back a little bit to after you finished up at UCSC, what were some of the your experiences right out of school? And what do you think you did at that time that worked well for you? I tried to find my way. I started teaching art in elementary schools. I did open studios. 
I did uh, one street fair festival and all of those things helped me to decide that I really need this work off the street, out of my studio, in a gallery with beautiful lighting. And I, I got that early on and I never made a copy, never made prints, never duplicated any of the work. It was always original and I made that decision super early, not knowing that that really could happen, but I was committed to it on a you know certain level. On the flip side, was there anything that you wish you hadn't done that didn't work well that you would prefer to either just skip over or not have done? And, you know, it doesn't have to be anything tragic or disastrous. It's just like, yeah, I spent a lot of time on that. Well, I think I learned about working with galleries and that I didn't need to jump through hoops. It's really a partnership and a relationship with a gallery director owner. And I think I, uh, I've gotten better in realizing that that foremost is most important, how you get along with that person. And instead of trying to please them or try to impress them or you know, make sure that you have longevity with them, I now feel that I have better judgment about that. I had a painting stolen from me from a New York gallery and I did everything I could to want to stay in that gallery because it was New York, but it was a dishonest person. You know, it was a hard lesson and there are horror stories <laughs> around gallery artist relationships. And, you know, I've had my fair share, but I've learned a lot and uh, feel stronger for it. If an artist came to you today and said something along the lines of, okay, I'm, I'm about to talk with this gallery. They're interested in my work. What would you suggest I look out for? Meaning what should I avoid taking from your experience? Well, it still happens to me to this day where a gallery will want to tell you how to paint. They want to tell you what palette to use, what size paintings. Go back to the studio. I think you could do better. And none of that is okay with me. <laughs> it's not their job. My job is to paint the painting and your job is to market and sell the work. And for you to give me feedback on whether the painting's good or not, I am the expert on that. I know whether it's good or not. I know that's my job. And I really draw the line right there where somebody is going to tell me how to paint. And I've had big, long arguments with certain people about that, thinking that the gallery is the one to tell you what would work. Well, I don't feel that I want to chase sales. I don't want to chase after the last four people that came in, what they said about the work and try to please those people. I just have to paint for me. And that's how the work is going to be good because it's going to be authentic and real and from my heart and you know as personal as I can make the work the better it is and if I get feedback people are asking for red really want red it's like I'm not even conscious of what color I pull I just grab color I'm just looking for combinations I like I'm not thinking gee I've got to go into the red categories for people that are coming in to look at the work so you know, I can't get that feedback. It just sours the work for me. Mm -hmm. You know, if a friend of your yours came to you and asked you that question, is are there any, is that, how would you recommend a person avoid getting into a gallery that might do it? Because there's plenty of galleries that don't. So I'm curious, like, if you have an idea of what sorts of questions people might ask ahead of time that would help them vet or get an idea an idea about the relationship they're about to enter into? Well, early on, I think you do want to please the gallery and you do want to make sales because that's how you're going to stay with the gallery. That's how they'll keep you. And so you do want to please them. And so I think it's just something that you go through. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, you know, getting feedback and then painting maybe slightly differently or different colors or there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just being aware that down the line that might shift or that might be something you want to look out for or be aware of. But certainly there's an understanding of wanting to please people to make a sale. I don't do commissions at all, but I will say 
I will paint that size and I will paint, they might ask for, they want me to repaint a painting that's already been sold and it's like impossible. So I say, yeah, I'll use the same palette and I'll paint the size you want, but then it's up to me because they're not going to get a good painting if, if they direct it too much. Yeah, yeah. And then I don't want that work out there, you know, representing. And plus, I want them to be pleased. I want them to have the best of me. You know, a person who's new to a gallery or new to the gallery scene, they don't have that security yet where they can paint exactly what they want and not cater to anybody. It's a give and take for sure. It's just something to be learned or keep in the back of your mind that your work will be better and stronger if it could just come from you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I paused because I was just reflecting back on a conversation that I had with one of my students recently. So actually, I'm going to pose this question to you because it's so interesting hearing how all different artists answer this question. Do you like to have input on your pricing? Or do you allow the gallery to do that? Or how do you manage that with the gallery? It started, you know, with my first gallery, which was Dolby Chadwick in San Francisco. It's set by size. So square inch. You don't ever want to favor one painting or another. It's standardized by size. So recently I raised my prices. I think it was 10% or 5% just for the 48 by 36 and above. And we all agreed on that. And so all the galleries changed the price to reflect that. I don't change my prices very often at all, but it's, so it's just standardized, which make everybody's off the hook. This is the price for this size. Yeah. I'm curious when you, when you said we all agreed on it, I'm, if you don't mind sharing it and you can say no, if you're not comfortable, but, and you do not have to give details, um, specific details, but I would love to hear how that conversation happens between you and multiple galleries about, about pricing your work. Like, for example, was it you that decided that you thought that you wanted to increase, do a little bit of in, an increase on that size? Or was it the conversation with the gallery? And then how did, how did that happen? Yeah, it, it was a mutual conversation. We decided the 48 by 36 and above would be most fair because to raise the prices on the smaller ones would make the small ones too high in price and not affordable for people. So we decided, you know, the bigger pieces would be affordable for people of a different economic level. When I was in New York, he raised the prices quite a bit without asking me because it was New York and they feel that they could really get a lot more for the work, which really messed up all the other galleries because everybody has to be on the same page. He was selling this work for much higher and so everybody had to change and they were very, very upset about it because they had a collector base for me that they feel betrayed. When you raise your prices, you want to be able to take your collectors with you. So you, you raise them just a small, small amount, just incrementally. And I, like I say, I hadn't raised them in like five years. Very rarely do I raise them. It affects everybody. And so just by raising them very slowly and discussing it, everybody was fine with it. Mm -hmm. So the most recent, this one that we were talking about, I'm saying most recent, which makes it sound like you do this often, which you don't, but the one that we were just talking about. So then you had a conversation with a gallery in particular and then called up the other galleries. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not to declare, but this is what I'm doing. What do you think? Oh, that sounds great. No, I agree. No, it's been a while. Okay. Yeah. It's welcomed. Well, yeah, I'm sure. And they would tell you, they would open up the conversation if they disagreed. Oh, definitely. Right. And there are people, you know, I, I know that there are other artists in the galleries that uh, have the same sizes and are asking for more. Their prices are different than mine. They're higher or they're lower. Or, but this is where I feel comfortable. And yeah. And that's important that you feel comfortable with it. And it's not just straight up mimicking what else is out there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's what the market will bear, no matter what. You cannot go down in price. So you better creep up slowly because there's no turning back. <laughs> right. There's no discount. <laughs> <laughs> 
have um, galleries ever asked you if you would do a discount? I've been asked that before, and I'm always like, no. Oh, that's standard fare. That is so standard. Yeah. Especially, you know, they're giving a discount to people that are, are multiple buyers. I mean, they've been collectors a long time or they've bought several of my pieces. But nowadays, unfortunately, everybody asks for a discount. <laughs> so the gallery's been bombarded with that. But it's only for people that are collectors or big collectors of the gallery in general. Right. The collector themselves have a relationship with the gallery. Yes. Right. That makes sense. So then do you have a range that you're comfortable with and the gallery knows that or do they call you each time? I'm pretty comfortable with them making that decision and they they will check with me, but they know that I'm okay with certain percentage. I kind of remember what it is, 20%, something like that. And then there's the designer discount too that they give. To interior designers. Right. But, you know, they're a big part of our business. The person who re- who asked me to interview you is a woman by the name of Kathleen Gadway. And a question that she had was, how do you abstract these women? And I think, I feel like you've kind of answered that in our previous conversation. But I am curious, like for yourself, when you go in there, I'm, I'm back in your studio again, Linda, when you go, <laughs> when you go in there, and you just start messing around, and you're allowing the painting to come to you, and you're you're in the state where you don't know, and you've kind of described your start as being very, is it completely different each time? Or are you sort of let me try it this way. And you make that start for like the next couple of weeks or the next five or X number of paintings. And then you try a different way. Or is it every single painting? It's totally anyone's guest. Every single painting is painful and new. I'm blindfolded <laughs> <laughs> and feeling my way around the wall. <laughs> and if it worked last time to start this way, I don't, re- don't even remember how that was. It's hard to describe to people what art is. It's just magical. And when it starts working and your editor is out of the room and the movie is on and the tummy is full, the feet don't touch the ground. And it's an out-of-body experience. It's something that we strive for. And it could be it lasts 10 minutes, but there is magic. And then you come back to life and you, you sort of clean it up or you know, but you don't even know how you painted it. And that's the fear, I think, of most artists is that you feel like you've painted your last good painting because you look at, at your work and you think, that is really amazing. How did I do that? Who did that? I'm sure you think that about your work too, Entries. It's so beautiful. It is magical and it's hard. I don't teach very often because I can't teach this. It comes from a place that I can't explain. It isn't about color theory. It isn't about learning about anatomy. I'm terrible at drawing. I mean, I can draw, but I, it's just so much work. And my theory in the studio, if it's hard, I'm not going to do it. (laughs) It's hard enough. You know what I mean? The arm is too long and it's like, well, you know, the overall effect is good. So I won't even change that because it really doesn't matter. And I don't try to abstract my paintings, my figures. It's just that I, don't want to say everything. I don't want to say what the face is or where the eyes are. We all know where the eyes are. So the leg is longer than it should be. It doesn't matter. You get that stance. You get that weighted body. You get that gesture because you've you've had it yourself. You're in that body yourself. And so those particulars don't matter. And that's why it seems abstract. It's just that it doesn't have to be explained so clearly. It's just the feeling. It's just an impression. Linda, that's a terrible answer for people who want the formula. (laughs) Oh, God. And, you know, I've (laughs) I've thought so many times, I get it. Oh, I know. I know. I'll project the figure onto the painting. And, you know, that lasts for one time. There's no formula at all. (laughs) Were you ever at a point where you were concerned about, you know, questions of like anatomy, you know, I know so many painters who are, you know, clearly it's a different genre, but they're so concerned about the precise anatomy. And when I see artists who 
are playing with abstraction and they want to, they're more interested in the emotion than the precision. They're more, more interested in the poetry than the precise description. It feels to me like the underlying fear is if I just do this, people will think I don't know how to draw. Right. Yeah, I, I go back and forth with that all the time. Like, I'll, you know, notice later that, oh, my gosh, her head is too large. And, you know, I want to get it right. I do struggle with that. And I had a professor at UC Santa Cruz say that I needed to learn about art history. And it's like, I don't want to learn about art history. I just want to do it now. I want to be in the present. I want to do it now. I want to look at artists that are painting and working now. I don't want to know anything. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not interested. It's too dry. And, you know, so it's the shoulds. And it's, uh, I should, I know how to draw. I know the anatomy. I know how to get it right. But do I have the courage and the nerve to get it wrong? And that's what keeps coming back to worry me is like, I want to get it wrong. I know how it adds to the emotion of the work. But yet there is that sense that people will think I don't, I'm not a real artist. I'm taking shortcuts. Oh, you don't, oh. She doesn't really know about anatomy. Right. That dangerous. I'm not a real artist. For the record, has a collector ever come back to you and complained that the anatomy was off? Never. Huh. No. No. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? Funny <laughs> how that works. Yeah. <laughs> That's something that people have to learn as artists. It is, it's the overall. It's the whole painting. It's just not that one corner or that one tree, right? It's the whole piece together. I loved what you've, you've said this twice now, my radar just went off this idea of wanting to get it wrong. You've kind of said my work is about getting it wrong. And you you're looking for that sense of comfort, you're looking for the gesture and the weight of the body. Um, But that's a pretty interesting choice of words. And I'm going to guess that you've thought about that. So (laughs) could you describe what it means to get it wrong or be in that state of mind where, where you're feeling that way? Like that's what you're going after? Well, I'm going after it because I can't get it right. You know, I mean, who can? We're imperfect. And part of my observation of observing people is that I might see a woman that looks pulled together and really attractive or color combination or the hair is pretty. And I, I just wait, I wait, I look, I watch, I wait until her go inward. And then her expression and her body language changes to into this real person. Whereas before, I see her as something on screen on in a movie. But I wait for that humanness. I wait for it. Oh, there it is. There's the self-reflection. There's the, she's like me. We're alike. We're connected. And I look for that. And you could call that imperfect or wrong, but we're all flawed. We're all not movie ready. And, um, And that's why I accept that in my work is I'm not movie ready. I'm imperfect. And it's a form of empathy in a way. I get it. You know, I get who you are. If you can accept this painting, you know, good for you. I've had one of the reactions that I love when I about my work is, uh, especially this one woman, grabbed me by the arm and she said, oh, my God, I have to leave. I have to leave. I can't take it. It's just, you just say so much about me. And she was just so emotional about it. And she said, I have to leave. <laughs> was the painting about her or was this somebody who just, I love that. Yes, me too. That was the biggest compliment I ever had. But another thing I love to do is watch people at the openings and watch what their body language does around the work, because they become the work. They shift their weight to one foot, their shoulders drop, they just get sympathetic or they connect to it because they see themselves in it. And I don't think people can really put it into words. I think they really are trying to match their sofa when they buy a painting or they, it reminds them of their daughter or all these other reasons. But I know underneath it all that there's something that is connecting for them. Mm, I love it. I love it. Yeah. There's that emotion is so powerful and yeah, call it, you know, however you want to call it, it's that 
not when you're not being watched. That's like a weird, but people do, especially when they're in public, tend to have a face. Right. <laughs> and, and then when you can take that mask off and see what's behind it, there's an actual human being. And it's so much more interesting than the mask. No kidding. And coffee shops are so great because people want to be seen. You know, that's why they're there. Look at me. You know, I mean, it's just, it's so great. It's perfect for watching that breakdown, you know, from the look at me to, oh, I'm real, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> it's, it's, that is fantastic. So, you know, as a kid, when my mother would say everything's fine, I knew by watching her that it wasn't fine. I knew. I thought I had magic powers. My eyes were magic. I could see more than other people. And that I was invisible because I could just sense and see that all these things that were going around on around me. I had magic powers. I could see things and I could hear things and I, I could feel things that other people weren't talking about. And sure enough, <laughs> when I get older, I find out things were bad. <laughs> yeah. It's a superpower, I think. You know, there is a sense of magic to it. It is just a heightened sense of empathy. And I think it's true that you probably can say things that nobody else notices. Let's say it that way. I mean, if I think people could if they took the time, but most people don't. And I know lots of people, I feel like in some ways that I'm like that, I'm hyper sensitive to other people's moods and emotions and all this stuff. And I really, really notice that stuff. And my husband's like, always kind of bewildered by that. (laughs) So I think it is sort of maybe the gift of the artist, or maybe that's what causes so many people who have that tendency to to become art. Like, I don't know if it's because you're an artist or because you have that tendency that the only way to express it is to be an artist. Yeah, well, you try to get people to say something and they won't, uh, they can't. Like I'll say to my husband, so what's up? What's going on? Oh, nothing. You know, well, I'm witnessing all kinds of emotion (laughs) and it's, you know, he's not aware that he's having, you can't put it into words, but I sense, I know that something's going on. But I was going to say too, that, you know, my work, I wouldn't say that it's easy work, but it passes because it's colorful and it's interesting as far as patterning and abstraction and a sense of landscape. It's passable, but it is kind of heavy. It is sort of difficult. It's not pop art. It's not our part apartment art, street fair art. It's heavy art, but it passes because it's, I kind of trick you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you now? I'm the girl at the coffee shop. (laughs) (laughs) That you just walk right by and don't even realize it's just nailed you. And yeah, right. Just fit right in. But yet. Yeah, it's the best place to be is the unnoticed observer. I love being there. A last question, because I know you've got to go. When people go to your openings, go to see your work in person in a gallery setting, what do you want them to walk away with? Gosh, I hadn't thought of that ever. (laughs) I'm always a little disappointed at openings. I don't even know what's supposed to happen, but I'm always a little disappointed. I guess I want more connection uh, with people there. I know what I want from them, but I'm not sure. I guess I want the same thing from the work. It's some kind of sense of connection, I guess. And like I said, I have empathy for people because they don't always know. They don't always know what they're feeling. And I do want them to feel something, though. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an emotional connection for them. And when that woman grabbed my arm, it was just like the best. But she could express herself. And um, other people want it to match the sofa. And that's legit because it doesn't matter if you need it in your life. I think it's reaching down deeper than a sofa. Mm-hmm. I think it's... <laughs> I would imagine because there's lots of things you can put on the wall that would match a a sofa. And I think um, (laughs) to choose one of your paintings, that might be the easy excuse so that they don't need to talk about it. But (laughs) but I think there has to be an emotional response. Otherwise, Ikea has posters of many colors. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, Linda, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. It was really fun. I would keep you on longer, trust me, but I'm going to no, honor. Yeah, I promised you. I will. Yeah. Hey, artists <laughs> love to talk to artists. So, you I know. know, I know. Where can people see your work right now? Well, you know, all the galleries always have work and a lot of times they have work up. So Sue Greenwood in Laguna Beach and the Strummel Gallery in Reno. Mm-hmm. Chris Winfield in Carmel and Gail Severn in Ketchum, Idaho. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast with the artist Linda Christensen. Thank you so much to Linda for sharing her story and to Kathleen Gadway for pointing me to Linda. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll find show notes there, examples of Linda's work, and links to connect with her and her galleries. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in large part by artists just like you. If you would like to help out, it's quick, it's easy, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash support. If this podcast has made a difference in your studio, if it gives you a little bit of company while you are painting, please consider making a donation. Any amount helps. And with that, I would like to give a shout out and a big, big thank you to Renat Gorin, Psychodynamic Yoga, Lois McCarthy, Robert Doucette, Denise Presnell, Sheree Seinkiewicz, Sheree, I really hope I said your last name right, Vivian Larkins, Diane Foster, Julie Riley, Leanne Harrison, Nicola Pixworth, Diane McGee, Robert Talbert, Judith Chapman, Susan Rose, Helen O'Connor, Julie Marr, J.A. Moore, Marilyn Creary, Teresa Hill, Vincent Keeling, Brian Buckrell, Alchemy Works, Denise Klitsy, Deb Cook Shapiro, Glary Fine Art, Lucinda Kasser, Pat Oxley, Jill Opelka, Susan Zefting Kuhn, Kathleen Speranza, ZB Gallery, and David Gorski. Thank you so, so much for your support of the Savvy Painter. So until the next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.